The Federal Judicial Center presents Supreme Court 1997-98, The Term and Review, an FJTN program for judges, staff attorneys, and law clerks. Now from the television studios of the Federal Judicial Center in Washington, D.C., your moderator, Russell Wheeler. Hello, and welcome to this third and final part of the Federal Judicial Center's review of the Supreme Court's just completed term. We're dealing, all told, with 52 cases from the over 90 decided this term, cases we think will most affect the litigation in your courts. Your written materials have summaries of the cases we'll discuss, in the order we'll discuss them, and brief biographies of the law professors who will be describing and commenting on the cases. This third part of our review will last about 30 minutes. Petitions by prisoners, including those seeking habeas review, are a substantial part of federal court dockets. Let's turn to seven cases the court decided involving habeas procedure or substance. Like last term, several aspects of the Habeas Reform Act were before the court. Uh, joining us are Susan Herman of Brooklyn Law School and Evan Sun Lee of the University of California, Hastings College of the Law. Evan. Uh, in this term's uh, habeas cases, we see the act, as I mentioned. We also see procedural de default issues. In some cases, we see both. Now, some people think the court made it a little easier for habeas petitioners to get into federal court um, under the act, and they point to this case of Stewart uh, v. Uh, Martinez Villarreal. Here you had an opinion by the Chief Justice and dissents by Justices Thomas and Scalia. Justice Scalia, really quite a forceful dissent. Yes. Um, I think it's probably true that this case does make it a little bit easier uh, to get into uh, federal court on habeas corpus. Uh, this case uh, holds that a habeas claim is not a second or successive application within the meaning of the Habeas Reform Act if it was uh, previously dismissed without prejudice. Um, as you know, the new habeas statute uh, places pretty severe restrictions on when a federal habeas court can entertain mm -hmm. a second or successive habeas corpus application. Um, the death row inmate in this case uh, had presented a number of claims to the federal district court, including a claim that he was incompetent to be executed. At that time, the district court uh, refused to uh, dismiss the claim because it was premature. So the inmate went back and after further state habeas corpus proceedings returned to federal district court at which time he presented the incompetency claim and this time the federal district court said well now it's a second or successive application within the meaning of the act and therefore it, ca it can't be heard. The Supreme Court uh, disagreed and analogized the second or successive application provision of this Habeas Reform Act to what it referred to as a modified race judicata rule. And applying principles of preclusion law, it was able to say, well, since this was not an adjudication on the merits, it is not a second or successive application within uh, the meaning of the act. Well, you know, Stewart was really almost caught in a very strange kind of twenty uh, catch-22, or you might say a catch-2254, yeah. if he had been too early and then too late to raise yeah. the claim. But yeah. the holding really goes beyond the unusual facts of Stewart's claim, doesn't it? Oh, yes, because if you think about it, uh, and the court actually brought this up in the opinion, is every time a court uh, dismisses for failure to exhaust, this case right. is going to apply. It's not a second or successive application. That's a dismissal without prejudice. That's right. Sure. Thanks, Evan. And, and uh, Susan, I mentioned uh, procedural default issues as well. Mm -hmm. We have this case of Trest v. Kane, in which the Court of Appeals sua sponte took on the procedural question. What did the court say there? Well, they said uh, a very limited holding. They said that the courts are not required to sua right. sponte raise procedural default, not answering the more difficult and interesting question, a longstanding question of what kind of defense procedural default really is. Is it an affirmative defense that's waived if not raised by the state? What happened in this case, Trest's petition was dismissed in the district court, and then the Fifth Circuit ruled against him on procedural default, even though the state of Louisiana had not mm -hmm. raised that defense, either in the Court of Appeals or in the court below. Now, the Supreme Court thought that there was some suggestion in the Fifth Circuit opinion that they thought they were required to do that, and therefore didn't get to the question of, is it permissible? A question which you, you can note would apply not only to appellate judges, but also to district judges and magistrate judges considering habeas petitions. Is there anything in the, uh, this rather uh, uh, cryptic line in Justice Breyer's opinion where he, he seems to chide the Court of Appeals a bit for not letting the parties argue the case, and then he says, uh, refers to that somewhat longer and often fairer way round, 
which is the shortest way home. Is that a, we know what's coming from that at all? Well, I think one thing that comes from that that also appears in another case, this term, Hone versus United States, where the Supreme Court essentially lets the courts of appeals know that it's, it's watching. Mm -hmm. uh, Hone was a case, right. uh, a petitioner really, uh, the, who um, raised a claim under Bailey, which seems to keep coming up, right. claiming that his sentence for using a firearm should be vacated once the law had changed. He lost below, and then the government claimed that he shouldn't be able to get a certificate of appealability, as is required under the Reform Act, because he hadn't shown he had a substantial constitutional claim. So the Court of Appeals denied the certificate. The government then changed its position and conceded that he did have a substantial constitutional claim. And the question was whether the Supreme Court mm -hmm. had certiorari jurisdiction to review the Court of Appeals' denial of the certificate. And the court, in a really you know, narrowly split mm -hmm. decision, five to four, overruling an old case, held that they did have jurisdiction, so they'll be watching. As part of the softening of the act, perhaps, think, that we've yeah, been talking about. A little bit, yeah. Evan, could you very quickly, uh, just in a sentence or two, tell yeah. us about this case of Calderon v. Ashmus? It, it came from California and involved Chapter right. 154. That's right, and all the court did here was uh, to refuse to decide uh, whether California qualified for the fast-track procedure under the, uh, for capital cases under the Habeas Reform Act. This just wasn't a proper case for mm -hmm. it. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we can spend a little more time on Spencer v. Chemna. That's the right. next case in our list. Mm -hmm. And this case further restricts who can raise habeas corpus right. claims in federal court. Uh, it also further explicates the relationship between habeas corpus and Section 1983. Uh, what the court held in this case was that a habeas uh, petitioner who has served his entire sentence, his entire prison term, um, generally cannot challenge a prior parole revocation on federal habeas corpus because it's moot. Mm -hmm. Now in this case the inmate or the former inmate uh, argued that well it's not really moot in my case because I continue to suffer actual negative consequences from my parole having been revoked. But the Supreme Court uh, didn't buy that argument. It said it was too speculative as to whether um, he would uh, suffer future parole revocations on the basis of this parole revocation because after all it was only one factor to, to be taken into account by the parole board and also said it was too speculative as to whether he would have to stand trial in the future and suffer the use of the parole revocation as impeachment evidence. Another consequence that Spencer was trying to argue was that he wouldn't be able to bring a 1983 action as exactly. you were mentioning because he wouldn't be able to satisfy the favorable termination rule of Peck versus Humphrey and another very notable part of the Spencer holding is that there are now five justices in the concurring mm -hmm. and dissenting opinions mm -hmm. who now agree with Justice Souter's position in Heck versus Humphrey that that termination rule shouldn't apply to people who aren't in custody. Right. So well, we'll watch that one. Uh, thanks, Evan. And Susan, just, just in a word, the case of um, Hopkins v. Rees from Nebraska. From Nebraska. This case was about the rule from Beck versus Alabama mm -hmm. where the court said that a jury in a capital case should be permitted to consider lesser included offenses which are consistent with some view of the evidence. Mm -hmm. Reeves wanted the jury charged a lesser offense that was a non-capital mm -hmm. offense, but the court looked at the Nebraska you know, statutory scheme and found that, in fact, uh, what, was, what he was asking for in the instructions was not technically a lesser included offense and that, therefore, the rule of Beck didn't apply. Under Nebraska, Under, Nebraska Because law. of the Nebraska right. law. Right. Thanks. Uh, Evan, uh, when we were in part one, we, we said we'd be getting to the Bowsley case, and right. we're there now. Um, We'll spend a little time on that uh, because this is probably going to have a lot of impact, day-to-day -day impact on federal courts. Came down the same day as Stewart, May 18th, same lineup. The Chief Justice wrote the opinion, and again, Justice Scalia yeah. and Justice Thomas dissented. Uh, what, can we in, what can we anticipate coming from this case? Well, this case is the first time that the Supreme Court has extended the actual innocence exception to the procedural default rule to a guilty plea situation, and Justice Scalia in his dissent uh, sounded a strong warning that this might open the floodgates because the Supreme Court, uh, because uh, this may come up every time the Supreme Court narrowly construes a federal criminal statute. What the court specifically held in this case was that people who pleaded guilty to using a firearm but who did not actively employ a firearm um, and pleaded guilty prior to Bailey versus United States in 1995, that these people can attack their guilty pleas as involuntary, even if they procedurally defaulted those claims during direct appeals. Right, so this is a situation that's not covered by Teague versus Lane. No, and in fact that was argued before right. the Supreme Court, and the court said that Teague does not apply because 
Bailey versus the United States did not create a new rule of criminal procedure. It was a narrowing construction of a substantive federal criminal statute. Uh, so the bottom line is that if a petitioner can demonstrate actual innocence to the firearm charge, he can attack the guilty plea. I think establishing actual innocence is enough of a problem, but there's also um, some dicta by Chief Justice Rehnquist yeah. where he says that it's possible that the defendant might have to prove not only that he's innocent of the particular charge, but also of charges that the government has foregone as part of the plea bargain. I think what's important there is that it's dicta. I don't think it is clear from the totality of the opinion that really a petitioner has to prove his actual innocence of charges that might have been brought but were in fact not brought. And in fact, kind of you playing off of Muscarello, the government here wanted to go back and charge Kerry, and the Supreme yeah. Court said, but that's not in the indictment, yeah, you can't charge that's that. That's true, but, but, but the court does make it clear that the government can adduce any evidence of guilt, um, whether or not it was brought up in the plea colloquy, whether or not it would have been brought up in a pre-Bailey uh, right. trial. Good enough. Thanks, Evan. Thanks, Susan. We'll watch how those things develop in the courts of appeals and the district courts. And in a moment, we'll take up the court's decisions that fall generally within the area of civil and commercial litigation. Standing, jurisdiction, Daubert questions. Federal judges face these issues regularly, at least where criminal cases haven't crowded them out. But bankruptcy cases, too, are an important element of federal court work. To conclude this review of the 1997 term, We'll look at 14 cases, starting with the trilogy interpreting the removal statute. Joining us again are Erwin Chemerinsky of the University of Southern California, John Garvey of Notre Dame, and Susanna Sherry of the University of Minnesota. Susanna, I referred to this uh, removal trilogy. Uh, let's talk about those three cases. Rivet v. Regions Bank is the first of them. Yes, and I think Rivet is the most important of them. In Rivet, the court cut back on federal, lower court federal jurisdiction. Uh, federal courts had been taking jurisdiction in what are called reverse removal cases, where a federal court had issued a ruling, and then the losing party filed again in state court, but only raising state questions, but the federal court would be race judicata. The federal court ruling would, be, would have preclusive effect. And instead of enjoining the state suit under the, the relitigation exception to the Anti-Injunction Act, sometimes lower federal courts would instead allow the case to be removed to federal court, even though it apparently raised no federal question, and then they would dismiss the case. And in Rivet, the Supreme Court cut that off. Mm -hmm. They said, no, you cannot take jurisdiction unless there is a federal question in the well-pleaded complaint. And since uh, preclusion is an affirmative defense, it's not part of the well-pleaded complaint, and there is no jurisdiction. Mm -hmm. Susanna, what are, what are district judges going to do in these cases? Are, is in, enjoining their only option now? Well, some lower courts have been using the old Ritz Act to allow removal. And in fact, mm -hmm. the Eighth Circuit recently reaffirmed a case that it had decided before Rivet using the All Writs Act. The case was remanded after Rivet, and, this, and the Eighth Circuit reaffirmed its hmm. decision. And several other circuits have done it as well. And eventually, the Supreme Court, I think, will, is going to have to decide that issue. Okay, so that that, that issue can come back at, at some point. We want to talk briefly about Wisconsin Department of Corrections v. Shack. Now, this was a easier case, I think. Yes, I think this was much easier. The, the question in Shack is a case that the lower courts have been struggling with for some time. What happens if a case removed from state to federal court has some claims that are barred by the 11th Amendment Sovereign Immunity Doctrine? Mm -hmm. Does the federal court still have jurisdiction over the remaining claims? And in Shack, the court said, yes, it does. It was a very straightforward, common sense interpretation of the removal statute. Though I think there's an interesting question of whether a state's removal of a case from state to federal court is a waiver of its 11th Amendment immunity. Justice Kennedy raised this in a concurrence. Ultimately, I think whether or not its waiver is determined by state law, but the Supreme Court's yet to clarify that. So we can watch for that also. Definitely. <clears throat> I said we had a trilogy. The third case is Chicago versus uh, College of Surgeons. And this wasn't a medical dispute. Uh, College of Surgeons had a building they wanted to tear down. The Chicago Landmark Commission wouldn't let them do it for historic preservation reasons. Justice Ginsburg said in dissent that this case was going to open the floodgates of removal cases into federal court. Now, 
Should district courts be worried about that? I don't think so. I think Justice Ginsburg was worrying unnecessarily. This was really a fairly routine case. Uh, the only question was whether you can remove from state court to federal court a state suit that just happens to be a review of a state administrative decision. There were straightforward constitutional questions on the face mm -hmm. of the complaint, so it met all the requirements for federal jurisdiction and for removal. The only question was whether there ought to be an exception for state suits that were reviewing administrative, state administrative decisions, and the Supreme Court majority said, no, there doesn't need to be an exception. <clears throat> and presumably not a, a flood of litigation coming in, we can assume? I don't think so, because these cases have pretty routinely been before sure. the federal courts. Okay, thanks, Susanna. Um, Irwin, the Judicial Panel on Multidistrict Litigation, that's not a, a household word, but every judge knows about the panel, because as more litigation goes national, the panel does more work in transferring cases. It transfers cases to judges for pretrial, but transfer judges have been keeping these cases. The Supreme Court had to decide in lexicon whether the statute allowed them to do that. That was exactly the issue in lexicon versus Milberg. The question there was, when a case is transferred by the multi-district panel, can the receiving court conduct the trial, or does it only have jurisdiction for the pretrial proceedings? And the Supreme Court said it only has authority for the pretrial proceedings. This is a case that arose out of the securities and loan problems of the 1980s. The case was filed in Illinois and was transferred by the multi-district panel from the Northern District of Illinois to a federal district court in Arizona. After the pretrial proceedings were completed, the Arizona court, over the plaintiff's objection, said it was going to keep the case mm -hmm. for trial. The Supreme Court looked at the literal language of Section 1407A and said the federal district court that receives the case only can handle the pretrial proceedings not the trial proceedings. This happens fairly often, too. I was very surprised at how often. There were statistics in the case that indicated that over 200 times a year, the receiving case court keeps the case for the trial proceedings. Erwin, if this happens so often, and if now the Supreme Court has told the district courts they can't do this, do you think this might be something Congress would be interested in fixing? In fact, there's already legislation that's gone through the House of Representatives that would give the authority for the receiving court to keep the case for trial proceedings. We'll keep an eye on that, obviously. Thanks, Susanna, and thanks, Erwin. And John, uh, Susanna made the point earlier that uh, we seem to see the court this term, her phrase, reigning in the lower courts uh, in certain areas. We have this case of Steel Company versus Citizen for, for a Better Environment, which that appeared to happen again. This involves when courts have to take up and decide the jurisdictional issue before they get to the substantive right, issue. Right, right. This was a case sort of like Rivet, the case that Susanna was discussing a minute ago, where lower courts had been finding jurisdiction in Rivet, it was it was race judicata removal mm -hmm. jurisdiction. In this case, th it was a, an issue of what we call hypothetical jurisdiction. The lower courts had been finding, it, and the Supreme Court said you can't you, uh, you can't do it anymore. It was it was a suit under an environmental statute, the Emergency Planning and Community Right to Know Act, and the claim on the merits, the issue was uh, whether the act. Uh, provided a cause of action for purely historical uh, violations. This was a failure to file some environmental forms that Citizens was complaining about. The closely related standing question was whether a plaintiff like Citizens had a right to sue when the violation was already over and they couldn't get any fees. Uh, the mm -hmm. the uh, fines were paid to the federal government. So the, uh, the question, um, the jurisdiction over standing question was could they, um, the, what were they suing about? Now. Justice Stevens, who dissented, was was willing to go ahead and um, answer the question on the merits, which he viewed as an easier question than the uh, than the jurisdictional question. So uh, there's some efficiency in doing things that way. But uh, the Supreme Court said that that was a violation of Article Three, that you have to decide these cases, these uh, questions, in the right order. You got to do jurisdiction first because hypothetical jurisdiction produces hypothetical judgments, and that's a violation of Article Three. You mentioned the efficiency argument. Justice Breyer concurred only in part and uh, recited the rather dreary statistics about appellate court caseload and said it just doesn't make any sense in some cases not to let them go ahead and spend their time deciding the issue, uh, avoid the jurisdictional issue. It's obvious how it's going to come out anyway. And ju tell me this. Justice O'Connor seemed to indicate that the few exceptions to this rule that Justice Scalia mentioned in the opinion uh, actually were there to be exploited, and there might be other exceptions. Uh, is there much there? I'm not sure what... Justice O'Connor had in mind the possibilities that she was pointing to weren't things that are going to happen all the time. There was a case called Norton against Matthews and another one called Secretary against Everett where the court in fact passed over the jurisdictional question, but in each of those 
cases, there was a companion case where the merits was decided, so there was really literally no point in going ahead with, and deciding the jurisdictional thing. But I don't think that's something that's going to happen all the time. <clears throat> so Susanna's reining in probably really was not reining yeah, in. Yeah, right. Thanks, John. Erwin, um, the, the media gave a fair amount of attention to this case of National Credit Union Association versus First National Bank, because obviously it has implications for credit, the credit industry and the banking industry. There were some jurisdictional questions, though, and we might spend our time on those. Specifically, what the Supreme Court had to consider was standing, and in particular, the zone of interest prong of the standing doctrine. In that sense, I think it was an unremarkable reaffirmation and application of the zone of interest test. Specifically, what was involved here was that bankers and bankers associations brought a suit against the National Credit Union for its decision to allow credit unions to cover employees of small businesses, even though the business had no affiliation with the credit union. And the question was, did bankers and bankers associations have standing mm -hmm. under the Administrative Procedures Act? And the Supreme Court said bankers and bankers association were within the zone of interest that the statute was intended to protect, and thus they had standing. And that's why I say it was a reaffirmation and application that the zone of interest test is a prudential standing requirement. Erwin, I think this case and the case last term, Bennett v. Speer, on standing are very interesting because they seem to be reversing the recent trend toward cutting back on standing. In both this case and in Bennett, the court applied the zone of interest test to find standing, and not only to find standing, but to find it for plaintiffs we might not ordinarily have thought the statutes were designed to benefit. In this case, it was the competitors of the credit unions, and in Bennett v. Speer, it was people who were opposing environmental regulations. That's a good point. And more of that, more of that may happen. We'll watch it. Thanks very much, uh, uh, John. While we're on jurisdictional matters, uh, say a, a word about the Textron case. This involved a jurisdictional provision in the Labor Management right, Relations area. Right, right. The the Labor Management Relations Act, as right, you right. know, th uh, th uh, has a provision that says that, that gives the federal courts jurisdiction in Section 301 over suits for violation of a of contracts between an employer and and a labor union. And in this case, the United Auto Workers sued. Uh, not because anybody had breached the collective bargaining agreement, but because they said they'd been induced by fraud to enter into the agreement mm -hmm. and they, they wanted to declare it voidable. And the Supreme Court said, that's not what we mean by suits for violation. There's got to be, you can't undo the agreement. That's what the statute says. <clears throat> uh, we, I also said at the very start of this program, we weren't going to talk about the line item veto case, uh, Clinton v. New York. But we should just make a, make a brief mention of the uh, jurisdictional issue there especially because the, uh, the court threw it out on... on uh, yeah, there is an interesting year. procedural point that's related to the observation that Suzanne and Irwin were making about expanding jurisdiction, mm -hmm. or expanding standing in, in a few of the cases this term. Last term, you remember, in, in, in uh, Reigns Against Bird, they threw out right. a challenge to the line item veto. This year, they found plaintiffs that they, that they were satisfied with that, that had standing, but oddly enough, they were plaintiffs who in the past might not have been given standing. They were plaintiffs who were making a complaint about some third party's tax liability. There was a, a farmer's co-op that wanted to a, acquire a food processing group and their claim was that the line item veto had canceled, had, had, had imposed capital gains taxes mm -hmm. on their seller and so the purchase was going to be more expensive than they had intended. So that's, uh, they were complaining about the taxes that someone else was going to have to pay and the court said they could go ahead. So that's how they got in. These are all separation of powers issues we've been discussing. We're going to turn to the, the federalism case, not a, not a really big case, but it's the full faith and credit clause, uh, Baker versus uh, General Motors, a uh, Michigan state court case and a federal diversity case. It's a case that received a lot of media attention, but it's a factual situation that's unlikely to come up very often. Specifically, the issue is if a state trial court issues an order that precludes somebody from being a witness against a particular defendant, does the federal court have to give full faith and credit to that order? What was involved here was a Michigan trial court as part of a settlement issued an order that a former General Motors employee could not testify against General Motors in the future. Turns out there was a federal district court case in Missouri, person to diversity jurisdiction, where this individual was going to come testify against General Motors. And the issue is, should the federal court give full faith and credit to the state trial court ruling? And the United States Supreme Court reversed the Court of Appeals, and the United States Supreme Court said, Full faith and credit doesn't apply here. The enforcement of the Michigan trial court order should be in Michigan court. So the individual could testify in federal court, though he's likely to face another court date in Michigan state court when it goes about enforcing its order. We, we may not see that case uh, uh, cited uh, uh, an awful lot, but 
the, uh, one case we have seen a lot of is this case, the 1993 case of Dow versus uh, Dow, Merrill Dow. And the court revisited that issue, or part of it, in the case of GE versus Joyner this term. I think GE versus Joyner is one of the more important cases of the term. The issue is when a federal court of appeals is reviewing a district court decision with regard to the admissibility of scientific evidence, what's the standard of review? The Supreme Court said it's an abuse of discretion standard of review. What was involved here was an individual got small cell lung cancer, and he sued his employer saying exposure to PCBs on the job caused him to get the lung cancer. He wanted to introduce expert testimony that the trial court judge precluded. The district court said there's too great a variance between the testimony and the data for it to be admissible. The United States Court of Appeals reversed and said under Daubert it should have been admitted. The United States Supreme Court reversed the Court of Appeals. The Supreme Court said that it's an abuse of discretion standard. Only if the trial court decision is unreasonable or unsupported by any view of the record should it be reversed. It's great discretion granted to the trial courts in this area. Which, which plays right into the, 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 the phrase from Daubert, the gatekeeping function of the, of, the, of the district court. There was allusion to that, John, also in uh, a case from the uh, military appeals uh, court involving polygraphs. Uh, spend less time on that than, than the references to the Daubert question in that case. Mm -hmm. Right. I, uh, this, this is consistent with the gatekeeping function of the district courts, I think, it were in a funny way. The military rules of evidence say that you can't use polygraph evidence. And this case involved an airman who was who was charged with having methamphetamines after they were found in a urine test, and he wanted Shepherd. to introduce Shepard. I'm sorry. Right. He wanted to introduce favorable polygraph evidence on his own behalf, and the military rules kept it out. So his claim was that this was unconstitutional; that it violated his Sixth Amendment right to put on a uh, fair trial. And the court said that uh, that that wasn't so; that at least the admission of polygraph evidence wasn't compelled by the Constitution. Well, now, the, so the admission of polygraph evidence is not a constitutional <coughs> right. You have no constitutional right to admit this, but is it admissible if both parties uh, want yeah, to? In a, in a sense, Sheffer um, wanted to take a step too far because I think that there are some pretty clear indications in the opinion, although it doesn't hold this, that it's in the discretion of the district courts. There's a there's an opinion by Justice Kennedy in which the, uh, there were four members of the court voting for that, an opinion by Justice Stevens dissenting, all of which can point to the discretionary authority of the district courts to allow this in. Uh, finally, John, um, you recall we talked in the first part of the program about Bragg and the Abbott, and that part of the, uh, we, we reserved that part of the opinion that dealt with uh, how courts assess the objective reasonableness of health care providers' decisions uh, to treat someone with uh, a disability may threaten the health and safety of others. Did you pick up on that discussion? Right. You, you remember me saying that there were two questions in, in the Bragdon case. One of them was whether asymptomatic HIV was a disability, and the other one was whether it was uh, one of those uh, infections that posed a direct threat to health and safety, and so the so there was a, an exemption or an exception from the from the ADA. And on that second question, the court said whether it poses that kind of threat is a question of objective reasonableness. The court didn't decide whether, in fact, the the uh, the dentist's action in Bragdon was objectively reasonable. But the interesting evidentiary point about it was that they said they sent it back to the Court of Appeals mm -hmm. for a. Uh, a review of that question and suggested that the Court of Appeals should give special weight to the evidence offered by public health authorities like the, uh, the, uh, the National Institute of Health, the Center for Disease mm -hmm. Control, the Public Health Service, and groups like that. The, uh, a, a majority of the courts seemed to think that that was appropriate. There were four dissents on that point, and the dissenters said, look, what kind of weight this scientific evidence to get should depend on how good the science is, not whether these people are hired by the public or not. In fact, Chief Justice Rehnquist made a, made a reference to uh, politically appointed heads of these right. agencies. Uh, we'll see, uh, thanks John, we'll see additional developments in this whole Dauber area. Uh, I, I should mention first the court uh, granted cert in a case involving the testimony of a tire safety expert, they'll hear that next term. The district court had excluded the testimony because it satisfied none of Dauber's criteria. The Court of Appeals reversed holding that the testimony, the tire safety expert testimony, wasn't scientific and thus not subject to Daubert. That case is Kumbo Tire Company versus Carmichael. Second, the uh, Judicial Conference's Advisory Committee on Evidence Rules has approved for public comment an amendment to Rule 702, which would extend Daubert's gatekeeping function to all expert testimony, 
And finally, Congress is considering two proposals that would essentially codify Daubert. The Evidence Advisory Committee believes that its proposed rule change would accomplish the same goal without some serious problems that it sees in the legislation. Let me add that next year the Center will publish the second edition of its Scientific Evidence Reference Manual. It includes a foreword by Justice Breyer. It's important to note two straightforward unanimous opinions that resolve conflicts over Bankruptcy Code Section 523 on exceptions from discharge. A Cohen v. De La Cruz involved 523A2A, which accepts from discharge any debt for money to the extent obtained by fraud. Does that exception reach treble damages? Yes. Uh, Justice O'Connor had little, little trouble concluding that the provision reached treble damages of 90000 awarded under a state fraud statute, and not just the 30000 that a landlord owed in overcharged rent. If Congress had wanted only a restitutionary recovery, it would have said so. In the other case, Kawahu gained a malpractice judgment against Geiger, a physician, for inadequate treatment that eventually required her legs amputation. Geiger, who didn't have any malpractice insurance, filed for bankruptcy and sought to have the malpractice award discharged. Kawahu objected under 523A6's exception for any debt for willful and malicious injury. Uh, Justice Ginsburg, in a fairly brief opinion, that like so many this term, parsed the statutory language, held that willful modifies injury, and thus that debt was dischargeable because Dr. Geiger did not intend the injury that his malpractice caused. Uh, she pointed out that to read Section A6 otherwise would render superfluous the drunk driving exception in Section 523. That concludes our third and final program on the 1997-1998 Supreme Court term. We hope you have found this review helpful, and we hope that you will complete the evaluation forms to tell us how we might improve future programs. Many thanks to the faculty for their summary and analysis, and thanks to you for joining us. Good day.